This is a moment in our Armen Armenian history that is a catastrophe of epic proportion. Epic proportion. Some of what I'm going to discuss today is going to be difficult to hear. Some of it is going to be difficult to digest. Some of it is going to be difficult even to believe. But I can assure each one of you today that everything we're going to discuss is true. It's painfully true. It's disgustingly true. September 14th, 2023, at a congressional hearing right here on Capitol Hill, Assistant Secretary of State Yuri Kim testified, and I'm quoting, the United States will not countenance any action or effort to ethnically cleanse or commit other atrocities against the Armenian population of Nagorno-Karabakh. Five days later, Azerbaijan ethnically cleansed the entire Armenian population of Nagorno-Karabakh. Secretary Blinken then tweeted from Turkey that he was discussing, and I'm quoting directly here, the situation in Nagorno-Karabakh and finalizing Swedish accession to NATO with the for Turkish foreign minister. In almost laughable lockstep, the New York Times, who for 286 days refused to publish anything material on Azerbaijan's blockade of Nagorno-Karabakh was suddenly awakened. Nobody saw it coming, was the headline. Really? Nobody saw it coming? Nobody saw the utter depravity leading up to that moment? Perhaps the New York Times missed the official government stamp Azerbaijan had issued depicting an exterminator in a hazmat suit actually cleansing Nagorno-Karabakh of, uh, of Armenians. Or perhaps Ambassador Kim missed that military trophy park in Baku proudly showcasing gruesome and bloody mannequins of fallen Armenian soldiers displayed in a public park for Azerbaijani children to mock and degrade. In fact, at the time of Ambassador Kim's testimony, Azerbaijan had already circulated videos of Armenian captives crawling on their hands and knees being prodded like animals with metal pipes by Azerbaijani soldiers. Armenian children had already been decapitated by Azerbaijani drone fire. Elderly Armenians had already been decapitated by Azerbaijani soldiers using handheld daggers. Armenian women had already been marketed for rape on Azerbaijani social media channels. The orders came from the very top. The president of Azerbaijan, in this century, a century after the genocide, as at least properly noted, the first Armenian genocide, was referring to Armenians, to many of us, as dogs. Azerbaijani politic politicians were calling Armenians cancers, tumors, and rats. Nobody saw it coming. Nobody thought that maybe Azerbaijan was preparing to exterminate the Artsakh Armenians like rats, chase them out like dogs, cut them out like cancers. No one? What did they think was going to happen? as the Azerbaijani army completely encircled Artsakh, starved actual human beings to death and submission, cut off cities, families and villages, shot farmers, cut gas, electricity, denied them water for 286 days. Children and churches, languages and livelihoods, families and freedoms, all degraded, 
desecrated, demeaned, destroyed. This is not never again. It's not never again at all. One nation, two genocides, one century. It's a national catastrophe of epic proportion. Epic proportion. So how in the world did we get to this moment? This is what I want to talk about today, here in DC. Because how we got to this moment has as much to do with decisions made right here in this city as it does with that hereditary dictator thousands of miles away in Baku. You know, it shocked me when policymakers and think tanks in Brussels and Washington started suggesting at the end of the 2020 war that the best outcome for Nagorno-Karabakh would be some sort of integration or protected status within Azerbaijan. That was a narrative developed and sold by policymakers here in Washington and over there in Brussels as a settlement, sorry, a dignified settlement to the Nagorno-Karabakh crisis. And the story went like this. Artsakh Armenians would be given certain rights and protections to live peacefully within Azerbaijan. And thus, Azerbaijan's territorial integrity would be respected and Armenians would live safely and with dignity in their homeland. You may remember the language. The international community told Yerevan that if it would just lower the bar on Artsakh and speak about the Artsakh Armenians from the perspective of minority rights, not as a people with the right to self-determination, but as a minority. And then by some geopolitical magic, the seas would part, peace would reign, and the global world order would find a beautiful equilibrium in which all peoples of the region would flourish. This was a false narrative. Washington and Brussels were advocating to place Armenians under the control and authority of Azerbaijan right at the time when Genocide Watch had raised the genocide threat level facing Artsakh Armenians to levels 9 and 10, when the Lemkin Institute for Genocide Prevention had warned that Azerbaijan's actions, and I'm going to quote you here, are part of a larger genocidal pattern demonstrating Azerbaijan's armenophobia and genocidal intent aimed at the eradication of Armenia, Artsakh, and the Armenians. In that documented reality, the solution being pandered by sophisticated parties right here in DC was to actually place Artsakh Armenians within Azerbaijan? That's a workable solution for the fate of actual human beings? Integration when 100,000 Armenians remained under total blockade by Azerbaijan for more than nine months? Integration when Azerbaijan was seeking to completely isolate, encircle, and starve actual human beings? The administration's dignified solution was to push the Artsakh Armenians into the authority and control of a regime intent on destroying them. That we even allowed this narrative is appalling. You know, there's a reason why Armenians have a visceral aversion, a sharp stop to the thought of being subjected to the authority of the Baku regime. Actually, there are a number of reasons. Shushi, Baku, Sumgait, Kirovabad, Marava, Nahicheban, all of them brutal massacres, all of them the ethnic cleansing of Armenians by Azerbaijan. Aliyev is cultivating a society committed to destroying the Armenian nation. And this is not hyperbole. Aliyev has said it himself. We will destroy you, he told the Armenian Prime Minister. And he's not done. Just over a year ago, Aliyev announced the creation of the Goicha Zangezur Republic, a new republic 
spanning from Gyumri to Sunik in Armenia itself. And before you laugh it off, think about this. Azerbaijani soldiers carry maps of this new republic in their pockets. And Yerevan itself is on those maps. Unrealistic? Aliyev has people parading in Brussels and Geneva and right here in Washington, D.C., advocating for what he calls Western Azerbaijan. That's the name he uses for Armenia. And he won't stop at a peace treaty. Fascist upstarts just don't stop. We already know this. In addition to his forced occupation of Nagorno-Karabakh, Aliyev's armed forces, as Elise mentioned, now control 31 towns and villages inside Armenia. And his military posts are literally positioned across from Armenian elementary schools. So that you can actually, so close, you can actually hear the masked soldiers talking to one another in their heavily armed and fortified posts. Think about the view outside your kid's school right now. And Aliyev has friends in this campaign to subjugate and destroy the Armenian people. Erdogan stood next to Aliyev at a military pr parade in Baku after the war and openly praised Nuri Pasha. He's the Turkish leader who actually executed the eastern flank of the Armenian genocide a century ago. The message was clear, at least to the Armenians. Don't worry, said Washington and Brussels. We'll make sure that the Artsakh Armenians have security guarantees. You might remember that word, that phrase. Perhaps even a protected status within Azerbaijan. This was a colossal sham. What demented legal framework would allow or even condone pushing a targeted population into the military and political control of a perpetrator seeking to exterminate them? That would be absolutely absurd as a legal principle. It would make no sense. Except, of course, if we pretend there's no genocidal perpetrator. And that takes us back to Ambassador Kim's congressional testimony. Let's pretend there's no genocide. Let's pretend we don't know what Aliyev is planning. Better yet, let's pretend that we would never countenance it. You see, if we never name the perpetrator who's starving an entire people to death under threat of force, if we don't use the word genocide and if we pretend it's not happening, then we can continue to push Azerbaijan's integration agenda. Hell, not our kids. But there's a rub. Pretending that there is no genocidal intent is, well, it's pretending. And if you're pushing for integration where there is genocidal intent, you're helping Aliyev commit genocide, aren't you? You're literally helping serve up the victim. And there's a word for that in international criminal law that describes this kind of helping. It's called complicity. And it's really illegal. I want to emphasize this. Washington and Brussels were advocating for integration of the Artsakh Armenians into Azerbaijan while Azerbaijan was already engaged and was actively engaged right then in the ethnic cleansing of the Artsakh Armenians. The blockade itself is evidence of that campaign. And the backstory, well, the backstory is unavoidable too. Azerbaijan had already ethnically cleansed Armenians from every city that has fallen under its authority and control. Now, it even labors to cleanse the land itself of any evidence of Armenians, destroying Armenian churches, unearthing entire Armenian cemeteries, scraping away ancient Armenian inscriptions, and claiming Armenian churches are actually, well, they're Albanian churches. 
Recent reports even indicate that Azerbaijan was building concentration camps to house these integrated Artsakh Armenians. Just this month, Aliyev demolished the very parliament building from which Artsakh Armenians operated an actual democracy for 27 years. You see, Aliyev's integration agenda was actually Aliyev's genocide agenda. Human mutilation, beheadings, rape, indignities, dehumanization, starvation, isolation, concentration camps, and the destruction of cultural and religious heritage, those aren't the hallmarks of an integration plan. They're the hallmarks of a different type of plan altogether. Let's just not say it out loud. So what now? There are 150,000 indigenous Artsakh Armenians displaced from their native 4,000-year-old homeland. Don't forget the 30,000 that were displaced after the war in 2020. It's been 175 days. The situation is dire and it's urgent. Allowing Azerbaijan's occupation of Nagorno-Karabakh to persist, cementing it, simply cements genocide and rewards genocidal intent. Slaughter and you shall receive. And to be clear, nobody, nobody disputes the Artsakh Armenians' right to return to their native homeland, not even Azerbaijan. Azerbaijan says that they should return as Azerbaijani citizens. Think about that for a second. Would you send your children to live under Azerbaijani military and political control? To be slaughtered, to be starved, to be degraded, to be oppressed, to have their Armenian identity literally ripped out of them? Would you do that to your own children? You see, when the intent to commit genocide Hell, when acts of genocide are underway, and they are still underway right now, it is the right of return and self-determination that is required. Given Aliyev's genocidal intent, the Artsakh Armenians are entitled to return their, to their homeland under international protection, not to be pushed naked into the clutches of the very dictatorship working to destroy them. And don't be fooled by that sideshow. Peace treaties with genocidal regimes do not end genocides. <laughs> Actually, they empower them. They fuel them. They normalize them. They cement genocides. An entire Armenian civilization has been uprooted and is being destroyed in real time. Every day, Azerbaijan demands more. Just last week, it demanded four more villages in Armenia to be turned over or else. Or else what? More genocide? More displacement? More refugees? More occupation? More desecration? More mutilation? More what, Mr. Aliyev? You know, enough is enough. It has been a century of it for the Armenian people generations of it for the Armenian people. We must stop fueling a petty genocidal thug from destroying what is left of the Armenian people. And the way to do this is not by further enabling the perpetrator or by pretending Azerbaijan is not seeking to destroy Artsakh, Armenia, and the Armenian people. Azerbaijan must be forced to withdraw from Nagorno-Karabakh. It must be forced to end its military occupation of Nagorno-Karabakh. And it must be forced to accept an international peacekeeping mission to guarantee that which it cannot ever guarantee, the Artsakh Armenians' right to return to their indigenous homeland in actual physical security and with actual human dignity. Thank you.